time. Matthew Collar, ESPN's Courtney Cronin. We welcome in. He covers the Packers for ESPN. Rob Domofsky. Uh, Rob, give me a cheesiness level of calling this the Packers love triangle. One to ten. What would you give that? <laughs> uh, it's, it's good. I'd give it a a five or a six, okay. maybe even a seven, but I kind of like it. All right. That's better than I usually do with these. Because it's uh, it, right? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it fits. There, there's gonna be it's gonna be a a bizarre love triangle in, in a sense of you know Rogers uh, love and and the general manager. Okay, th- that's the most enthusiastic anyone has ever been about one of my terrible puns. So I appreciate that, Rob. Uh, well, tell us what you know. I mean, I, I'm sure that you went into the draft thinking, I wonder how they'll help Aaron Rodgers. And they came out with almost no help for Aaron Rodgers and a new quarterback. Uh, I'm sure that threw you for a loop. So give me your reaction. Well, the one thing I felt, Matthew, was that they weren't going to take a receiver in the first round. Not because I don't think they should have, but because that's just not what they do. Uh, they, they have had so much success developing later round receivers, and later, I mean later than the first round. I thought for sure they would take one or two at some point, just not in the first round. I, was, I knew they had done their work on the quarterbacks. We, we had talked to Brian Gutekunst, the general manager, before the combine. And we asked him every which way possible, would you take a quarterback at 30? And he said, yeah, if it was the right quarterback, if it was the right move. Now, I didn't know he was going to trade up from 26 to do, to do it. But we knew then that he was already starting to look at quarterbacks. And then the day before the draft, I was told that there was a 50-50 chance they were taking Jordan Love. I didn't report it at the time, but as soon as they made the trade up, to 26 i did put out there on twitter i said look i don't know if this is what they're trading up for but i was told yesterday that there's a 50 percent chance they take jordan love and about 90 seconds later roger goodell announced that they took jordan love so uh, i mean i'm not totally surprised because i'll take you back to the first time we sat down with brian gutekunst after he got the gm job i asked him i said Ultimately, do you think your legacy is going to be defined by whether you find the next franchise quarterback? Because Ron Wolf got Brett Favre, Ted Thompson got Aaron Rodgers. And he looked at me and he paused for a second and he goes, you know, I'm not thinking about that right now, but I get what you're saying. Well, two years later, he picked the guy. I know we're going to get into a little bit more about what this actually means uh, in terms of Aaron Rodgers, the future, and, you know, what the message was. But I am really confused by what uh, Brian Gutekunst had said about the wide receiver class, because it feels like there's 31 other teams that felt that was a very deep class. And apparently they just have their own way of doing things in Green Bay. And he said, no, I think there were 12. (laughs) And, you know, the situation that they were put in, not having the fourth round pick because they traded it to get Jordan Love, uh, that, you know, the guys yeah. would have had fifth to seventh round grades to undrafted free agent grades. I understand that, but why not address it with your second round pick that you did yep. have after Jordan love with your third round pick Rob that you had after Jordan yep. love, even in the fifth round, there were quality guys there. Why did well, they yeah. not address it? That's a great question. Um, it's one that we asked Goody several times after that third day, second and third day. And look, Courtney, I, I don't have a, a big problem with Jordan with the Jordan Love pick. If you think that he is the quarterback to take you to another decade plus of quarterback stability, fine, do it. But then my thinking is you have to, as A, a show of good faith to your current quarterback, and B, to help what is your weakest position, I'm thinking not only do you have to take a quarterback on day two, but maybe trade up to do it just to show – to make a show of good face. And, you know, they, I know they, they liked uh, Denzel Mims, but he was gone. And, and basically what he was saying was he loved the guys at the top, um, you know, the top four or five. And I know that Justin Jefferson was a guy that they would have loved to have traded up for, uh, but they just they couldn't get that high. And, you know, obviously, you know what happened there. Um, and then as for the rest of the draft, he basically just said, look, I didn't evaluate it as deep as, as a lot of people did, and I thought there were better value in other picks. I, um, I, I have a hard time understanding it, I, just like it sounds like you do. Uh, but 
that's their philosophy, and, and we'll see if it, it turns out to bite him. He said something interesting. He said, look, I just didn't think a receiver that I drafted on day three would have beaten out the guys that we have coming back, like Alan Lazard and, and uh, Mark Clez Valdez Gantling, Equinemius St. Brown, uh, Devin Funches, who they signed in free agency. So um, he basically felt like if I took one, the guy wouldn't make the team anyway. I don't know that I agree with it, but that's the thinking. Yeah, I don't agree with it either because I think there were still guys there even in the in the fourth round, fifth round that could have been at least intriguing for them. But especially going with the running back, that's the one where I really go, uh, OK, that's a strange pick to not help Rodgers in any way. And, and then the Bob McGinn report comes out, Rob, that says that uh, LaFleur is, quote, simply had enough of Rodgers' act. What do you understand about the relationship yeah, between that, those two? That's a – yeah – Bob could not be more wrong. Uh, Bob's completely full of crap on that. Um, look, a general manager, and this is the way it's, it's structured in Green Bay, and Bob should know it. The general manager makes the call on the, on the draft and the players. The head coach does not. Trust me, Matt LaFleur would have loved to have uh, a receiver, loved to have somebody that could help his offense. This, this Jordan Love pick does not help Matt LaFleur and now, and it may never help them. And here's why. Let's say they, they regress and go nine and seven this year. Um, Rogers further declines and they go six and 10, seven and nine the third year. Matt LaFleur could get fired without ever coaching Jordan Love. This is not, this, this is, Bob is completely wrong. Now, could, could Brian Gutekunst be tired of Aaron Rodgers and how he, uh, you know, maybe his, his body language when he, when receivers don't do what he wants? Sure. He could be tired of it. And here's another theory about that. Why would Gutekunst draft a receiver really high when there's a halfway decent chance his quarterback won't like him? So now you've wasted that pick because Rodgers is so hard on guys. So maybe there's that to it. But look, uh, this is not. This was not a Matt Lafleur pick in any way, shape, or form. I will soon, hopefully, have a piece on air, on ESPN.com uh, this week about the dynamics that went into it, and I can promise you that it will, it will say that LaFleur, um, this was not a Matt LaFleur-driven pick. So what is the message then that's being sent to Aaron Rodgers? Because with drafting a running back uh, with your second-round pick, and you're thinking that that becomes, okay, running yeah. back by committee, and this is going to become a run-first offense. Is that what they're saying, that they want to take the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' yeah. hands? Yep. Essentially, they want to be more like the 49ers, and – um, look, Matt LaFleur idolizes Kyle Shanahan. Uh, it, he's his mentor. Uh, he's one of his best friends. And the whole time last year was a little bit of a struggle uh, between running what Matt LaFleur wanted to run and what Rodgers liked from Mike McCarthy's office, offense. And, yes, there were things that he liked from Mike McCarthy's offense, contrary to, you know, what, what some people thought. And, and the, you know, the whole idea – of Rogers changing plays in the line of scrimmage, the play clock running down to three, two, one, so many times. That's not how LaFleur wants to play, but he let Rogers play that way because he's so good at it. But ultimately they want to get more, um, you know, toward becoming a, a run action team. That's not to say they want to take the ball out of his hands completely, but they, they want to, and these are LaFleur's words. They want to make it easier for Rogers. So he feels like he doesn't have to do it. Uh, the, the AJ Dillon pick, the running back, is uh, it's interesting because uh, he's totally different than what Aaron Jones is. Aaron Jones is the outside zone runner. They didn't have a guy who could run the inside zones plays that is that is the Shanahan uh, McVay offense. So so I get why they did it there. The the H back tight end pick in the third round is, is was even uh, to me a little bit more baffling. But if you look at the guy from uh, from the 49ers, and I'll never be able to say his name right, Kyle Juzes it or whatever Use his check. name is. Use check. Uh, <laughs> that's, whoa, 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 try that again. Ju Juzes uh, it? I can barely. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can barely pronounce my own last name. Use which, check. Oh, which has Use a lot check. of consonants in it also. Uh, Use, Use check? Okay. Yes, there you go. Uh, that, that could be the the – the H back uh, that they drafted could be, could be him. So, um, and if you ask me to say it again, I won't be able to say it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what does this mean then? Do they do they want to go with three head, three deep at running back? Do you think Jamal Williams gets cut? Are they just going to go with uh, Jones and Dylan? How how do you foresee, you know, if they are going to become a run first team, if they want to become San Francisco, how does that work with who they already have? Yeah. If they want to be, yeah. If they want to become San Francisco, they better keep all the backs they can get because Williams and and Jones, you know. Look, they took they, they took a lot of abuse last year. They they played a lot, um, and Lafleur said after the season, and so did Judicon, that we we actually need a third running back uh, with those two guys. And, and Williams and Jones are going into the final year of their contract. They have five starters that are going to be free agents next year: David Bakhtiari, left tackle; Kenny Clark, defensive tackle; Aaron Jones; uh, Kevin King. Uh, the cornerback and Corey Lindsley, the center, and that's not counting Jamal Williams, who's a backup, so it'd be six. I asked um, a scout and a coach how they would rank those guys one to five and who you would re-sign, and both of them, I wrote this about a month or so ago on ESPN.com, both of them had Aaron Jones as number four out of the five on the priority re-sign list. Oh, wow. Uh, just because running backs are not worth paying. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a decent chance that they – were with their first two picks, they found eventual replacements for both Aaron's, Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Jones. Yeah, uh, I, th- I think that we're having those conversations here about Delvin Cook, too, about how much you value a running back, even if he's special. I, I want to circle back with you, Rob, about just the right. Lafleur system and how it works with Aaron Rodgers, because we played a Greg Cosell a uh, bit earlier, him talking about how, you know, it, it, the Rodgers is not exactly the timing and rhythm quarterback that someone like Jared Goff, Jimmy Garoppolo, Kirk right. Cousins is. And those are the guys of this system. So how in your mind did it work with Rodgers in the new system in year one? And if, if it's going to work between these two to get back to 13 and three in an NFC championship again, where does it have to grow? Yeah, no, I think that's a great assessment of it because LaFleur compromised some of what he wanted to do, and, and rightly so because you've got a generational talent in, in Rodgers, but Rodgers didn't have an unbelievable season. He had a decent season. Um, he was efficient, as he usually is, only four interceptions, 26 touchdowns is really low. Um, completion percentage was still down. Uh, throwaways were still prevalent. Uh, but they, they, he, I thought LaFleur did his best not necessarily from a scheme and X's and O's standpoint, but just getting Rodgers to buy in from a leadership standpoint. And I think that's going to be his biggest challenge again this year because of the draft pick that they had. And if players are going to take their cue from Rodgers, and if Rodgers thinks they don't, they're not playing to win now, and other players can sense, this, sense that, that's a huge problem. And uh, LaFleur was able to, to really get guys to buy in last year, and he's going to have to resell them again this year. But from a scheme standpoint, uh, you're right. They want to get back to uh, playing quicker. Uh, and, and one of the things that even Rogers said uh, after the San Francisco game was there was a lot more to this offense that we never got to. And the up-tempo stuff was, was the biggest thing. And I know they were talking a lot about how important it would have been to have, or it was going to be to have an off season, you know, with this, the, the, the second off season in this system. And now that we're in this virtual world, that's just going to be so much tougher. Uh, but but Ryan Gutekunst and Matt Lafleur both said they can't wait to see what the offense looks like in year two uh, with Lafleur and Rodgers. But you know we'll see how how much they're able to change given the circumstances. Right. So last thing for you, do you see the Packers as having expectations of still being the division winner? with the Vikings having a very good draft. Uh, Chicago has a new quarterback. Detroit still has the same coach, so eh. But they got a lot of better players, I think, overall, uh, over the last uh, you know few weeks with the draft and free agency. So where do the Packers fit in in your mind? Yeah, I said it um, after the season that, you know, they were 13-3 and three and they could end up, with a better roster next year and with a worse record. Now, I don't think they have a better roster because they didn't draft what I thought they were going to do. <laughs> but it's going to be really hard for them to go 13-3 and three again because if you think about it, every break went their way last year. I yep. mean, they had they had zero injuries um, of, of significance. Devontae Adams missed four games. That was it. And they went 4-0 and oh in those games. They played the Chiefs right after Patrick Mahomes had the knee injury. He didn't play. Like, everything went their way. It's not going to be that easy. It just never is. 
that easy. It's not going to be that easy in year two. I, I can't imagine that they're 13-3 and three again. But that doesn't mean that they don't make some changes and, and they could be a 10-6 and six football team but actually have a better chance going into the playoffs. Now, you're going to have a hard time convincing me of that because they didn't add any weapons. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's going to be tough for them again. And, it, look, this is going to sound crazy, um, but if I, were the, if I were the Bears, I might think, man, everybody else in the division, you mentioned what Detroit did or didn't do, the Packers didn't get better. I mean, the Vikings, yeah, they drafted um, a great receiver, but they had a great receiver, and, and they let him go. So the net gain might, you know, might be the same. I, I'd be curious to see, you know, if the Bears don't jump back up into this thing in, in the division, and, and you know, they might be the most improved team. Yeah, there's a, there's a good case for it only because their quarterback was so bad last year that if their quarterback play is average and they get the rest. <laughs> Uh, then they might be more dangerous. Yep. They still went eight and eight with terrible quarterback play. Well, uh, Rob, the uh, Packer yep. drama is not over for you. I am certain of that. So we will uh, talk to you again very soon down right. the line. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. We'll be seeing you. Yep. Thanks for coming on, Rob. Um, Rob Domofsky there pouring some cold water on the Packers heat of, that is a uh, coming from green Bay. Well, uh, all right, now we get to play another game of who do you believe in their reporting, mm-hmm. Courtney? I mean, my favorite now, game. Isn't that fun? Uh, because we have relationships with a lot of people in the industry, and there are so many human beings that are connected to football teams that you can get information from one person and one reporter who says one thing, and then somebody else says another thing. It's very much like the Trent Williams conversation where Ian Rappaport is saying, yeah, he didn't want to come to Minnesota. And then Trent Williams and his agent are saying, no, that would have been fine. And like, it's very hard to parse through this. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's something to watch. I guess I would put it under that category in terms of LaFleur and Rogers relationship. I was going and you were too in the first segment entirely off of what Bob McGinn had reported that he's had enough of Aaron Rodgers' act is the exact thing that Bob McGinn wrote. Mm -hmm. Um, But Rob Domofsky says that that's not exactly the issue. It's more of just, they have a quarterback they believe could work out down the line who needs a lot of development. So who do we believe here? Well, I mean, I absolutely understand what Rob is saying. That And you can understand the argument of why this kind of screws over Matt LaFleur in a lot of ways, because if you want somebody, if you have an offense, somebody making, you know, rhythm and timing throws and yeah, Aaron Rodgers does wait till the play clock gets down to like one before he does that quick fake snap thing at the line of scrimmage and then, you know, somehow miraculously finds Devontae Adams open. I mean, that's, that is Aaron Rodgers. It's a gift that you don't get that often, but unless he really wants to become a run first team, like that could be the general manager's philosophy outweighing what the head coach wants to do. Like I could absolutely see that. I mean, we've seen what Mike Zimmer, you know, what he wants as a head coach has many times outweighed what his offensive coordinator has wanted to do in Minnesota. I mean, so it's not just the guy controlling the offense and the guy calling the plays who might be having the biggest say here. So I understand where Rob was going with that. Um, I still think that somewhere in the front office, whether this is a giant bleep you to Aaron Rodgers, it kind of still feels like that. Somebody somewhere is pulling those strings, whether it's Matt LaFleur or Bob McGinn. I mean, I'm very eager to read what Rob's piece is going to be on ESPN.com this week because it sounds like it's going to completely contradict what was put put out there earlier by Bob McGinn.